Hello, this is Dr. Paul Cottrell, and I'm recording this on October 20th. We're going to go over a few videos here. Before I start, please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com, and take a look at the great supplements that I have. I'm going to go over a few right now. I have the Myotrol. Myotrol is a great way to build muscle and to maintain muscle. It also improves your mitochondrial health. Take Myotrol to maintain muscle and build muscle. If you work out, if you're an athlete, if you want to build, you know, if you're a bodybuilder, build your physique, please take Myotrol. If you're older, please take Myotrol. The reason being, as we age, we start to atrophy with our muscle mass, and this is a great way to maintain and build muscle. So please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com and get the Myotrol. Olive leaf extract is a great product. It's a dual purpose. It'll help to improve your immune system and your cardiovascular system. How? It'll bring down inflammation that helps your immune system, but that also helps with the cardiovascular system because lower inflammation will reduce that inner lining of your blood vessel, uh, starting the whole process of collecting plaque, all right, and building up plaque. So you, you, you want to mitigate and bring down your inflammation to reduce new plaque buildup. So this is a great product. In addition, this brings down your LDL levels and increases your HDL levels. That means that you'll have less LDL floating around in your, in your bloodstream. And it's LDL that's oxidized, oxidized LDL that, that is the main component that starts the whole plaque process. LDL gets into an inflamed area in your blood vessel. And then you have macrophages that try to eat up that LDL oxidized LDL and it'll create a foam cell and then you have plaque buildup. So if you reduce your LDL, you have less oxidized LDL, you reduce your inflammation, you'll have less chances of building up plaque because you have less inflammation in the vascular system. It, but also by bringing down inflammation, you're also improving your overall immune system. So this is a great product. Please take it every day to help with your immune system and your cardiovascular system. All right, so what I want to do is I want to start with uh, the leaked documents that took place with, with uh, the Israeli plans that the Pentagon had to strike Iran looks like have been leaked. Now, the question is, is this some sort of, you know, counter operation to try to, to think and try to convince the Iranians that they were going to strike this way and they actually are going to strike something totally different? Is that some sort of, you know, counter intelligence that's going on? Maybe. Who knows? Is there a leak within the Pentagon that's upset with what the Israelis are going to be doing to Iran and they wanted to try to circumvent that military operation? That could be too. We don't really know, but it has been leaked. And the question is why, all right? In addition, I think in this video, they're going to be going over Netanyahu's house was hit. So I'd like to you know comment on that. So let's play live now, Fox, and, uh, and find out what was going on with the leak up doc. Welcome back, and thanks for joining us here at Live Now from Fox. I'm your host, Karla Hanna. I want to get right into uh, some tensions in the Middle East as we continue to hear more uh, headline developing stories. Conflict continues to grow. Now, to do that, I'm going to bring in a straightaway retired Marines intelligence officer, host of the Strap podcast, Hal Kemper. Hal, let's start with some big news that we got just moments ago. So, the United States apparently increasingly concerned after top secret documents showing Israel's plan for a potential retaliatory strike on Iran were leaked to an Iranian telegram account on Friday. Hal, what do we know about those documents? Well, it's a little bit shocking. Uh, uh, Corral, they, what it showed up on was a telegram uh, website or a telegram account, I should say. That's a social media account. It's used by, uh, so it's used here in the US, but it's used especially by Iran, Russia, uh, and a number of, uh, dare I say, nefarious state actors uh, for information. Well, it was a pro-Iranian 
uh, account that it showed up on. And it looked like what it was showing was uh, set of, uh, imagery, if you will, satellite imagery from the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, NGA, and also uh, what appeared to be transcripts of intercepted conversations. And what it had on it was National Security Agency, NSA, which uh, signals intelligence. Uh, all the reports coming out on it right now uh, from you know, so far unattributed uh, U.S. officials makes it sound like this may have been uh, a genuine issue. I mean, this was not something that someone just fabricated. And of course, the question is, was it, was this, is this a penetration of U.S. intelligence somewhere? Uh, the other concern is, was it hacked? And, and I don't know which one would be more uh, concerning if there was a successful breach through a hack or if there was an actual mole or something in U.S. intelligence. Now, the interesting thing is, that it has what's called the five eyes. Uh, it has, re you know, released to the the countries that compose the five eyes. Of course, the U.S. being one of those, and then Canada, United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, and this is a an intelligence, a special intelligence arrangement that goes back to World War II, with how we share intelligence within those five countries. So, uh, when you're looking at it, it does raise the question. Could it have been one of the other members of the five off? This is why I'm wondering, is this counterintelligence? You know, some sort of trick, you know, and it was released and it's a trick to think that Iran, you know, to, to get Iran thinking that Israel's going to go one direction, they're going to go in a different direction. Or is it that there's some mole within the whole intelligence apparatus? Now, my understanding was that it was leaked from the Pentagon, but maybe it was leaked by one of its, its intelligence allies, who knows? But, but the thing is, is that we, the whole point is, is there's, it's left unknown, right? And with that added dimension of unknowing, makes you wonder maybe Israel is actually going to strike something much bigger. You know, it's a bigger, a bigger event. I am on the side. I'm on the side of this that I'm wondering if this is counterintelligence. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to think it is. But, you know, maybe not, maybe not. But I just, there's, there's something weird about this. But it could be as much. It, it could be as easy as it was someone within the intelligence. Someone, someone high up in the intelligence apparatus doesn't like what Israel's doing. They're trying to circumvent it. It could be just that simple. All right. Now in Israel, their concern is that it, it's talking about all the preparations they're doing for the big strike in Iran. It wasn't specific as to targeting as to what they're going to hit. But it does talk about that. It talks. It shows uh, preparations at different air bases. It talked about uh, different types of training they were doing, uh, a variety of things like that. Uh, type of ordinance that they might be using was kind of inferred uh, from it as well. Uh, so uh, Israel's probably sitting there saying, oh, my gosh, uh, some of our planning and preparations have been compromised. And the other parts are probably saying, well, they're really spying on us a lot. I mean, they're looking at satellite photos of what we're doing and intercepting our conversations. So I'm not sure how that's going to play at a uh, diplomatic level, shall we say, uh, of that sort of thing. So uh, it, it's, it's going it, to be a big it, it can create an, another fear within Iran. You know, a lot of people would say, well, leaked information would tip the hand of the Israelis, and therefore, you know, uh, Iran is going to know what Israel is doing. Well, not necessarily. It could create more fear, especially if it's a head fake, right? So I'm not, I'm not so sure that this is the real plan. Maybe it is, or maybe it's one of the real plans because, you know, who knows? But is it a group of people or a person that didn't like the operation they wanted, the deep six, the op operation? That's possible especially as we get so close to the election and the Democratic Party are not doing so well. So uh, Trump looks like he, he might win. Um, so there's that dimension to try to 
you know, prevent more escalation in the region that might hurt the Democratic Party in, in the general election. There might be that dimension. But I still think that the probability is, is that this is a head fake. To hear more of it as the week goes on. So a U.S. official also told CNN that the deep is, the leak, excuse me, is, quote, deeply concerning. And what's interesting is that earlier today, we did hear from the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, he's in Italy, for the G7. And he had said that the U.S. would like Israel to scale back its attacks on Lebanon, particularly near the capital. But is that likely? And what kind of incentives does the U.S. have in order for Israel to scale back those attacks? Well, of course, the biggest incentive is that we, we're the, we're the so, biggest. So if Lloyd Austin is trying to push back on the Israelis and say, you know, put kid gloves on and stay away from the major cities, well, maybe he, Lloyd was the one that let, leaked it out. Who knows? I still think that it's just, it's almost like a head fake. They want to, they want to make, they want to make Iran think that it's moving one way and it's really doing something different. But it could be that it was just of Israel. We provide right. weapons and all sorts of other uh, support to Israel. So of course we have that leverage, if you will, uh, with Israel and saying that, you know, that they got kind of going back to the leak a little bit. There was some sort of Machiavellian uh, thought that maybe the U.S. or one of the other five members, five eyes members, may have leaked it intentionally in order to uh, do exactly what Secretary Austin was talking about, which is to uh, somewhat coerce Israel into scaling back the uh, degree of its uh, of its strike on Iran. Uh, I thought that was rather, uh, uh, well, rather Byzantine, to put it lightly, uh, that something like that was going on. I don't think that's where it was sourced from. I, I find that less likely than the alternatives. But, uh, but that was being discussed as well. But there is a lot of concern with the U.S. And, and some of our partners, of course, that whatever Israel does, that they might widen the conflict even further. And, of course, the problem is they're seeing uh, nations in the Middle East, other nations like Iran, uh, certainly Hezbollah, which is not a nation but a, uh, but a major uh, threat group in southern Lebanon, and Hamas in Gaza, that they're just they're not backing down. You know, Hamas is uh, still pushing forward, Hezbollah is pushing forward, and Iran may feel compelled to respond even more strongly. Speaking with these leaks and also what the Secretary of Defense had said, what does this tell us about how the U.S. feels on the trajectory of this war? Well, the fear is, of course, it'll widen the conflict. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, I think the fear, the, the hope was that when Sinwar was killed, that uh, this might be an entree to get some sort of ceasefire deal uh, put in place in the Gaza Strip. That's not looking uh, any closer right now. Uh, also, there was some hope that uh, certainly at the end of last week with, with Lebanon pushing really hard and Hezbollah's uh, somewhat public acquiescence, that there might be a separate ceasefire deal for just southern Lebanon between uh, Israel and uh, Hezbollah. Uh, I don't rule that out, but uh, it does appear that certainly for Israel, they have a lot more things they want to accomplish from a military standpoint before they agree to anything. And the other problem is that there are certain stipulations of what that agreement would look like that, that, that Hezbollah just simply is not there. You know, part of that is that they pull all their forces out of the, uh, the area in the UN Resolution 1701, South Lutani River. Well, that has not happened. There's a disarmament provision of Hezbollah on that. That certainly has not happened. So there, there seems to be a long way to go before they could get to something where it would be a, a more permanent ceasefire uh, type arrangement, let alone peace, uh, if you want to call it that. I want you to talk a little bit about what was leaked in this document as well, because I do have the report here. Um, it was a report from CNN. And it says that the document described Israel moving munitions around and Israeli Air Force mm -hmm. exercises involving air-to-surface missiles, seemingly in preparation for an attack on Iran. 
And given kind of these tidbits from that leaked document, what would that attack look like? Well, for, for Iran, they could certainly go back and figure out, okay, they're pulling this type, they're going to use this type of ordinance, and they're doing this type of training, which means they're looking at these types of strikes. And certainly any target intelligence uh, uh, officer could go back and look at that and say, well, based on that, I think they're looking at these particular targets. I think that this is how they plan to prosecute these particular targets, depending on uh, the specificity of what's in there and certainly what they can, you know, they take from what they know to what they have now and what they can put together from that. Uh, certainly Iran knows where its potential targets, you know, things that, that Israel like to hit, they know what those are. That's not an unlimited pos number of possibilities. And within that, they have certainly looked at how Israel might potentially try to strike those. So they already have a, uh, uh, dare I say, a, a template of how Israel might want to do that. So you take whatever you glean from these argument, uh, from these uh, documents, you put that, you apply that or compare it against the template of what you think or what they would think Israel would do, and that would narrow down the number of targets that uh, Israel would possibly be looking at. So you can actually glean a lot of information, a lot of intelligence from uh uh, a limited uh, array of uh, information within the documents, not just what was leaked, but it's what was leaked in context with what's already known. And that's where, you know, basically uh, Iran would develop greater insight on, on what Israel wants to do. And of course, the consequences are that they could shift around their air defense assets and put uh, uh, Israeli Air Force pilots at greater risk doing those missions because, frankly, they would have said, look, this is how we think they're going to come in. This is what we think they're going to do and take all the countermeasures that they possibly can in order to, uh, you know, mitigate that risk. And that's another way of saying trying to shoot down the Israeli aircraft. So there is a real human danger uh, when stuff like this comes out. There's a uh, there's a, a lot of things that certainly Israel is assessing right now. And Israel, and then, frankly, this leak will probably end up pushing things back because I would imagine they're going to go back and relook at everything and make some changes simply to create a greater degree of uncertainty with the Iranians as to how Israel plans to strike. Uh, when we spoke earlier about you coming onto the program, this wasn't even the story that we were going to cover. So this is coming on the mm -hmm. heels of another headline that we're following. I want to showcase some video here that was... Uh, provided to us a little earlier today, and this has to do with a drone that was launched toward Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu's house early on Saturday. That was confirmed by the Israeli government. Now, there were no casualties. Neither Netanyahu nor his wife were home. Now, this comes after Israel's war with Lebanon's Hezbollah has grown worse in the last couple of weeks. How? The first question is, how does a drone get so close to Netanyahu's house? I think that's the same question that Netanyahu's been asking uh, of the uh, Israeli Defense Force Chief of Staff, which is, how did a drone get so close to my house? Um, the question is, what is the gap in the, uh, in the Iron Dome and the Israeli air defense picture that allows this drone to get into the, you know, to the prime minister's home? Uh, and then on the heels of a drone, another drone strike that hit a military base where it killed four IDF soldiers, uh, seriously injured dozens of others, uh, hitting, hitting this uh, mess hall, this uh, cafeteria, if you will, uh, when it was full of troops, uh, a, a concentrated uh, troop target, if you will. Uh, how did it get in there? And then, of course, this falls, you know, some weeks after. Or I think one of the answers that the Iron Dome potentially has been damaged and or it doesn't, it, it, it it's, uh, its anti-missile battery is depleted, you know, and they, it, it needs to be replenished. And I think the bigger variable here is, is it's porous, especially with small devices that can move around, not, not in an arc kind of way, but, you know, a drone can move around and, and with different flight patterns. So I just think the Iron Dome is, is much more porous than what, what, they, what they thought. But I wouldn't be surprised if the Iron Dome is somewhat damaged from that last Iranian strike.
the uh, Houthi drone that managed to go out and fly right into metropolitan Tel Aviv. Again, theoretically, with the Iron Dome, none of these things should have happened, but they did happen. And so they're going to be looking at a number of things, which is the capabilities, the technical capabilities of the drone will certainly be looked at very closely. Uh, you know, seeing if the drone has anything where it's able to somehow fly in a more stealthy mode or somehow evade radar or any other detection before it gets all the way in there. Uh, so they're going to be looking at tactics, techniques, procedures that the uh, Hezbollah drone operators are using that they could get in this far. Uh, they'll be looking at you know timing of when the drone came in to see if maybe there's some gap tied to that. They'll be looking at a number of different things, but the big question is how how are they able to pull something like this off? And of course, you know you could extrapolate out and say if they can hit the prime minister's house, who else could they hit? You know, if, if that's supposed to be a, a more well-defended property, I would say, than uh, a number of other homes and properties in Israel. So the question would be, well, if they can hit here, where else can they hit? And and that's that really gets into the whole psychological dimension of, uh, of warfare, which is uh, causing great uncertainty and, uh, and of course, uh, casting doubt upon the, uh, the IDF and Israel's ability to defend against attacks like this. And then how, the next question is, what capabilities need to be in place to make sure that this does not happen again? Well, the one thing they're gonna be looking at are, are drone countermeasures, all right? Uh, Anti-drone systems. You know, it's interesting, uh, you may recall this week, uh, we put a theater, uh, uh, not theater, terminal, uh, high altitude air defense, THAAD system. Uh, with a hundred, about a hundred U.S. Remember, troops. Remember when I said it several videos ago that over time, this battle space is going to be much different in 2006, right? Because of this drone warfare, right? And we're moving towards this uh, a different type of era of warfare. You know, every major advancement in war you know, leads to a different dynamic. You know, like for example, um, uh, when tanks were introduced during World War I, and even airplanes, it changed the dynamic of trench warfare. Mechanized, really mechanized warfare in World War II, all right? And um, urban centers being more dense, and fire bombings from aircraft, and bombers, and it's, it changed the, the battle space. You compare, let's say, World War II to what was going on during the revolution, the American Revolution, you know, where soldiers were lined up and their muskets, you know, were, you know, shooting off in, into the field against the enemy. But there were these, you know, large armies, large batteries of, of, of uh, soldiers, you know, tactically moving uh, on the battlefield, right? Much different type of warfare during, let's say, the Civil War in the United States and the current urban warfare we have today. So in each one of these eras, there was an advancement in technology. There was an advancement in the weapon or the the bullets, the ammunition, artillery, um, um, you know, uh, you know, adding another dimension to the battle space. You know, instead of it being two D, it became three D. You know, with planes, and so now we have satellite technologies and maybe lasers and and all these things that have changed the battle space that's moving towards what I call Star Wars. You know, this, the, what, we, what I remember with some of the movies for Star Wars, we're kind of moving in that direction. We're at the very early stages of it with the whole drone, lasers, and energy weapons, and all this stuff. And even the body armor is moving towards, you know, almost like a stormtrooper kind of, you know, look in a way. So we're seeing the, the emergence of a, a different type of warfare. 
and drone warfare is is one of it. You know, this whole shield uh, in Star Trek, it was shields up, right? You know, uh, and it was you know an energy shield that prevented some sort of torpedo coming in or some sort of missile system coming in to disrupt it. But that shield would be damaged, could only absorb so much damage before the shields went down. And something similar is happening with the Iron Dome. You have these missiles that are knocking stuff out. It's not an energy system that's absorbing it, but it's something similar. It's the beginnings of a shield system, you know, like on, in Star Trek. But we're moving, we're, our warfare is changing. And so the, the, just because something happened in 2006 where there was a failure doesn't necessarily mean that will be the case in 2024 because of this, these new dimensions of warfare or these new capabilities. And I think that's where Scott Ritter gets it wrong. He thinks that Israel's going to lose because they lost in 2006. The battle space is totally different. now. That doesn't mean it's going to be a cakewalk, but it's different. So you can't say that because of 2006, this is the, re the reason why 2024 is going to be a failure or 2025 is going to be a failure. I think the battle space has changed. That we actually deployed into Israel. And a lot of people say, with their Iron Dome system, why do they need this? And it was to plug a gap with a specific ballistic missile capability and uh, they were saying hyper velocity ballistic missiles which i always find a rather interesting term because most ballistic missiles flying at high altitude are hyper velocity because that's simply how fast they they've always flown uh but they're they're trying to plug this gap with this u.s uh, uh high altitude air defense system uh and that was something they saw from the attack that just occurred in early october where some of the iranian ballistic missiles even though they were knocked off, you know, for the most part, knocked off track, you know, they, they had one impact at 500 yards from Mossad headquarters. They had a couple of hit a, uh, you know, an air base that had F-35s, our most advanced uh, fighter bombers that we provide the Israelis. So they needed to plug those gaps. And that was one thing. Now they're going to be looking closer to Earth, so to speak, which is uh, gaps in the uh, low altitude realm, which is where these drones are probably flying. Again, I don't know what altitude or what what trajectory these drones came in on. I don't know what their flight path. I don't know if they were doing something like Napa the Earth, where they were flying so low to the Earth that uh, uh, that they couldn't pick them up on radar. Uh, I don't know if they were command controlled or completely autonomous. Uh, so these are things that the IDF is going to have to figure out. With some of the Shin Bet, their domestic intelligence service is going to be looking at very closely as well to try and find out everything they can about this. And then the other question is, even though they're, they're saying they're launched by Hezbollah, I can't rule out that they, they could have been launched from somewhere else. They could even be Hezbollah launched drones and maybe launched from a location other than say Southern Lebanon, maybe somewhere else. So they're gonna be looking at these things as well to try and figure all this, all this out and then figure out where are all those gaps, what are those deficiencies and what do they need to do to uh, to plug them, and uh, so that I, they, I think I don't know if you're going to see a thad type solution for that, but you're going to see something happen, and I imagine it's going to be pretty big, pretty dramatic, and pretty fast. How that brings me to my next question, because I can't imagine that all of our viewers, including myself, are weapons experts, so to speak. Could you maybe give us a bit of a briefing on the different types of drones and which ones pose the biggest threat? Well, there's there are different types of, you know, in drones, there's a lot of different things of drones. I mean, when you get into uh, some of the larger drones that, that the U.S. flies, those actually look like, you know, almost like commercial airliners. They're so big. Uh, so they have drones, you know, the, 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 the Triton series and things like that that are used for persistent high-altitude surveillance that fly, I'll say, 60,000 feet plus uh, above ground level, uh, AGL. Uh, those things tend to be very large. And then there's ones that are in a medium spectrum. They're, they're larger. The MQ-9 Reaper fixed-wing drone, uh, we've lost a number of those uh, due to the Houthis, but we've lost them elsewhere in the world as well. Those are per fairly good size. Um, and, and, you know, the Predator-type drones, uh, certainly when I was overseas in uniform, 
Uh, I was on the flight line uh, right next to those and got to see them up close and personal. And uh, so uh, they're, I mean, the size is a relative thing. You know, I mean, are they bigger than a Cessna or something? Well, yeah, they don't look like a Cessna, but they, they have, you know, you get into wingspan and, and things like that. They're, they're pretty good size. And then you get down to smaller drones, and a number of these drones, uh, some of them are fixed wing, a lot of them are rotor, quadcopters, and things like that. And if you get all the way down to the very smaller drones, you get to stuff like you saw with the drone that went into the living room, where Yaya Simwar was sitting on a chair throwing a stick at it. Well, that drone, and I'm not entirely sure what type of drone that is, but that might be a drone that's a uh, uh, akin to the Dragonfly series drone that, that we produce. And that's a drone that literally can sit on the palm of your hand. It's a very tactical drone. It doesn't have any weapons capability, but it's great for intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance at a very tactical level, like a squad or platoon, uh, which is a small group of maybe a dozen or a couple dozen. Uh, it tells you what's in that building, what's over that hill, what's around the corner. These are very, very small drones. Some call them uh, micro UAVs, if you will, uh, which is micro unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, very small, and I've seen stuff uh, so small that literally it looks like the size of an insect. Uh, some amazingly small drones. Again, not designed for weapons, although I, I have heard some other exotic applications of putting, using them for assassination stuff and putting a very small explosive charge and. There's an Air Force video I, I've had that I use in my training where it actually shows the drone landing on a terrorist's head and then exploding. It's all done in cartoon, but you get the idea of what it does. And uh, so these are all within the area of theory of, of what's going on. This drone here was probably, uh, my guess, is a fixed wing drone that had pretty long legs. It could fly a, a pretty considerable distance, obviously had a warhead. And, uh, and so they're going to be looking at that, that, that area of drones. But then again, that's why I say they're going to have to go back and take a look at this. This, might, this drone may have come from somewhere other than southern Lebanon. And they're going to have to figure out if maybe this was a different type of drone that was launched from a different direction. Maybe it was launched within Israel, or maybe it was launched from within the West Bank or something like that. I don't have all the details. Everything they say so far makes it sound like it came from southern Lebanon. But... More to follow. This is uh, kind of breaking news. Well, given all the topics that we've touched on in this conversation, and it was just two major headlines really that we discussed, but is Iran preparing or are they ready for an all-out war with Israel? Corral, hey, that's kind of interesting. The problem Iran has is they don't have any way to really do an all-out war with Israel. You know, uh, first off, if I could quote the real estate, uh, saying location, location, location. They have no border that they share with Israel. Uh, they've got a couple of countries between them and Israel. So, and they don't have a, they don't have a really uh, robust, capable, mechanized ground force with a lot of aviation support where they could do something that, say, the United States could do. They're not going to do something like we did in 2003, where they went up to bank, where we went up to Baghdad. They couldn't pull something like that off. Uh, they're certainly not going to do something like Desert Storm. And I would point out when you look at the geography, you go, well, they would have to cover, you know, that times 10 to get over to Israel. So they're just really physically, they can't launch a ground war. There is really no conceivable way they could launch a ground war in Israel. So what you're looking at are missiles, planes, maybe ships. Uh, things are going to be a little bit more distant. They don't have any naval infantry capability where they could do any landings ashore or any way to project anything like that. They don't have any big airborne capability where they could drop troops into Israel, which would be uh, somewhat preposterous to even think of Iran trying something like that. So they're somewhat limited. Israel, on the other hand, has a lot of force projecting capability. They, they could theoretically put boots on the ground in Iran, although Iran, I just want to point out, is an enormous country. It is huge. And it's also a long way from Israel. So they've also got a problem of uh, how do you logistically support such an operation? How do you get your forces back if you were to insert them in the first place? How do you insert them in the first place to get them in there? Uh, although they could do some things like we saw in Syria not too long ago, where they did a strike on a, it was an Iranian facility in Syria that, that actually created, that actually produced uh, munitions. 
And they went in there with special operations forces, did a raid on the ground, boots on the ground, and, and then covered it up with air strikes and drone strikes as they were leaving. Uh, that's that's very conceivable that something like that could happen in Iran. But I think right now what we're talking about is an exchange uh, for for Israel. Uh, a lot of airstrikes is what I would anticipate using some of the advanced fighter bomber capabilities they have, like the F-35, F-16s, F-15s. Uh, they're provided by the U.S., uh, perhaps some drone capability. Obviously, things they can do in the covert realm with their clandestine services. And then the other side would be uh, what Iran could do, which includes drones, but really what we've seen this last time was mostly ballistic missiles. But I would say the problem that Iran's going to run into is that once, depending on what the target sets are that, that Israel goes after, it's going to have a seriously debilitated capability to project force with both missiles and drones uh, after Israel strikes. And I would not be surprised to see if that's one of the first things Israel does is basically uh, uh, to take out their ability to respond with uh, drones and missiles as a response to the Israeli strike. All right, Hal, I know that there's so many topics that we wanted to touch on today, but unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it at that. I always appreciate your time right, here. Before Hal. we go to CNN I, about this this item, about the leaks, the leaked documents, please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com. Get the vitamin D3. This is synergistic with my vitamin K2 on my store. Also, vitamin D3 helps to absorb calcium. And it's a gene expression cofactor. So you can have proper gene processes happening in your cell. So please take vitamin D3 every day. I take a soft gel in the morning and a soft gel in the evening. If you follow my protocol, you can reduce cardiovascular disease with vitamin D3. And you can also reduce or eliminate osteoarthritis. So just follow those protocols. In addition, vitamin D3 helps to get rid of cells that need to go into apoptosis, especially if they've been infected. So please get the vitamin D3. This will help with your overall health, your, the overall processes in your cell, and uh, get rid of cells that need to go into apoptosis. Natokinase. Natokinase will help with your cardiovascular system. It's fibronolytic, so it'll break up clots. In addition, it'll bring down LDL levels and increase your HDL levels. So it's improving your, your lipid profile. So it's improving your cholesterol. Please take natokinase every day. It is synergistic with my omega-3 that I have in my store. And lastly, ubiquinol. Ubiquinol is something I've been taking for decades. It's really important. Ubiquinol is CoQ10, the activated form for CoQ10. So take ubiquinol. It'll boost up your, your energy levels. It's an antioxidant. In addition, it also helps with neuroprotection. It helps with the, the, the health of your neurons. So when you get older, you need to take ubiquinol to maintain your neural health. And you need ubiquinol to soak up those free radicals and boost up that energy level because it helps with the health of the mitochondria. Please take ubiquinol every day. It's very important. All right, so let's go to CNN uh, discussing about the leak documents. Really concerning. That's how U.S. officials are describing the leak of highly classified intelligence documents detailing Israel's preparations for an attack on Iran. Axios was the first to report on that leak, and CNN's Natasha Bertrand is joining us now live. More Natasha, which more. Uh, Natasha, I know you've been talking to sources as well. What are you learning? Well, Jessica, we have managed to confirm that these two documents that were leaked on Telegram on Friday do appear to be authentic, and they are highly classified documents that suggest that the U.S. has been essentially spying on Israel's plans to retaliate against Iran for that massive missile barrage that Iran inflicted on them on October 1st. And these documents are uh, a marked top secret. They are also uh, they also have markings suggesting that the only entities that should be viewing these documents are the U.S. and some of its closest allies, the Five Eyes Partnership. And so this is obviously very concerning to U.S. officials. And while we are not going to uh, quote from these documents... Okay, this is interesting because 
live now didn't say that it looked like Israel was spying on, I'm sorry, it didn't look like that U.S. was spying on Israel, All right? That's what live now, that was the interpretation I had from their broadcast. CNN is a little bit different. And remember, CNN is pro-Democrat, pro-CIA, pro all this stuff, right? So, so this adds to another dimension. What are some of the possibility? What's, what's the possibility space for the leaked documents? Israel shared the intelligence with the U.S. and the U.S. This is one of the options. Israel shared the intelligence with the U.S. Maybe there was some sort of joint sharing of intelligence to build up some sort of strike plan between the U.S. and the Israelis because Israel probably needs the help of the U.S. So that makes sense that they were sharing information. So with that assumption, it could be that someone within the U.S. intelligence system or one of their one of the other allies decided to leak it out. All right, to try to circumvent the Israeli strike. That's a possibility. Another possibility is, is that this is just misinformation to to trick the Iranians on what the strike plan is. That's a possibility. Another Additional possibility is Israel was working with the United States to develop a strike plan. All right. And maybe Israel wasn't sharing everything. Maybe they were. And is and the United States was spying on Israel and decided to leak it out to circumvent them. Now I still think that this there's a high potentiality that this is, is a some sort of counterintelligence kind of operation to try to trick Iran to think what the strike plan is. I still think, I think that's the case. I'd have a hard time believing that someone within the intelligence agency would want to, to leak stuff this out. Now, the five eyes, I believe, are the UK, the United States, Australia, Israel, and I thought New Zealand. I thought those were the five eyes. So, you know, what's really going on here? So that's why I keep on thinking that maybe this is counterintelligence. There's some sort of counterintelligence operation to do a head fake with, with Iran. Who knows? But it's interesting that she brings up that it seems as though the United States was spying on Israel. Chances are Israel was sharing the information because they needed some sort of telemetry data and some sort of probably satellite data from the United States to, to help coordinate just in case of their a, a counter strike by Iran. So I, I don't know about this. Something, something doesn't, something doesn't seem to jive here. Share them directly. We can outline them broadly. One of them, for example, which is sourced to the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, uh, discusses Israel's uh, movement of certain munitions in order to prepare for a possible strike on Iran. Another document, which is sourced to the National Security Agency, discusses the Israeli Air Force's preparations and exercises for a strike, including information about the Israeli Air Force's use of, uh, of air-to-surface missiles. And so this is obviously going to cause some consternation, to say the least, uh, in Israel itself. And of course, it comes at a very delicate moment between the U.S. and Israel. And it really reveals, I think, something interesting, which is that for all of the United States' efforts to get information directly from Israel and, you know, intelligence about what they're planning to actually do in Iran and having all of these conversations, they're still collecting intelligence on them and doing surveillance on their activities so that the U.S., of course, can get its own understanding of what might transpire. And so for now, what we're hearing from U.S. officials is that they're not going to confirm the authenticity of these documents for now uh, when we reached out for official comment. But we are told that one of the main focuses of the investigation at this point is just determining who had access to these documents to begin with. Jessica. I have a thought here. Let me just skip to this. Disappear from social media and do this instead. Become a master of AI tools. First, stop scrolling. Second, all right. So, so it's possible. Another possibility is is that 
the United States was spying on Israel because maybe they felt as though Israel wasn't sharing as much information. And maybe Israel wasn't sharing as much information because they were per they were worried about leaks coming from the Biden administration. All right. So it's possible that the United States was spying on, on Israel's strike plan. Israel spoon-fed a little bit of the strike plans to the United States, and the United States wanted to understand more of the operation. That's, that's possible. And as they were doing that, someone within the inter, someone in the in the intelligence community found out that this was happening that was either maybe Israeli or sympathetic to the Israeli the, the Israeli cause or just didn't like the idea of the, the United States trying to circumvent Israel and so they leaked it out to show to the world at large that the United States was spying on Israel. There's that, that dimension too. So it's like spy versus spy versus spy versus spy versus spy versus spy. You know? So you got all these like, you know, counter counterintelligence and counter counterintelligence and counter counter counterintelligence. So uh, who knows what's really going on? Um, it's too James Bondish, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised that the United States is concerned because they got caught with spying on an ally, which has has happened in the past. I mean, they were spying on France, they were spying on Merkel, you know, for Germany, they were spying on the UK. So, I, you know, the United States has been doing some nefarious things too. So maybe they were caught and someone decided to leak it out to, to prove, to show that the United States was, was, was doing that. Now, what's interesting is, is that I would say a pro-Israeli, a pro-Israeli, I would say, I would say live now, uh, uh, live now, or yeah, live now. I, I would say that they're more aligned with Israel cause than the Middle Eastern cause, just like Al Jazeera is more aligned with the Middle Eastern, the, the, the Arab cause, right? So I would say live now is more aligned with the, the Israeli cause and, and this. CNN, I feel, is more aligned with some sort of ex expedited political solution that doesn't really solve the real problem. And that I wouldn't be surprised that the intelligence agencies have been trying to circumvent Israel's move on Iran. And so them leaking the documents would try to one line of thought is to try to prevent them, prevent the, the Israelis from actually striking. Another line of thought is, is that they were spying. They didn't want it to be weak. Someone found out that they were spying on Israel and leaked the documents. So, so it would show to the, it show the people at large that the U.S. was spying on Israel. I just find it odd that CNN said that. Right. Let, let's rewind. Let's rewind what they said, and and just maybe maybe I'll get a different interpretation when I hear it the second time. This is the first time I've seen this video, so you know, bear in mind. All right. So let let's just let's just replay what they're talking about and see. Against Iran for that massive missile barrage that Iran inflicted on them on October first, and these documents are uh, a marks top secret. They are also uh, they also have markings suggesting that the only entities that should be viewing these documents are the U.S. and some of its closest allies, the Five Eyes Partnership. And so this is obviously very concerning to U.S. officials. And while we are not going to uh, quote from these documents or share them directly. We can outline them broadly. One of them, for example, which is sourced to the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, uh, discusses Israel's uh, movement of certain munitions in order to prepare for a possible strike on Iran. Another document, which is sourced to the National Security Agency, discusses the Israeli Air Force's preparations and exercises for a strike, including information about the Israeli Air Force's use of 
uh, of air to surface missiles. And so this is obviously okay, so going to cause the five, the five eyes are Australia, Canada, New Zealand, UK, and the United States. So I didn't realize Canada was involved. Okay. So Israel's not in the five eyes. I'm surprised at that actually. All right. So Israel's not a fit, is is not part of the five eyes framework. So it wouldn't be if that's the case, then they may have been trying to get intelligence by it on Israel to find out what their strike plan was, because maybe the United States felt as though Israel wasn't keeping them so much into the loop. I'm sure Israel has mentioned some things about what, what they wanted to do with, with Iran, but the Biden administration leaks. So they, you know, maybe this is not a counterintelligence. Kind of, maybe this is not to do a head fake with Iran. Maybe this is to try to circumvent the actual strike by, by Israel. All right, so so I mean I'm thinking on the fly here. So I just I just want to just I'm trying to triangulate some of these data points that are coming from media. Uh, movement of certain munitions in order to prepare for a possible strike on Iran. Another document, which is sourced to the National Security Agency, discusses the Israeli Air Force's preparations and exercises for a strike, including information about the Israeli Air Force's use of. Uh, so, uh, air to surface missiles. And so this is obviously going to cause some consternation, to say the least, uh, in Israel itself. And of course, it comes at a very delicate moment between the US and Israel. And it really reveals, I think, something interesting, which is that for all of the United States' efforts to get information directly from Israel and, you know, intelligence about what they're planning to actually do in Iran and having all of these conversations, they're still collecting intelligence on them and doing surveillance on their activities so that the U.S., of course, can get its own understanding of what might transpire. And so for now, what we're hearing from U.S. officials is that they are not going to confirm the authenticity of these documents for now uh, when we reached out for official comment. But we are told that one of the main focuses of the investigation at this point is just determining who had access to these documents to begin with, Jessica. Let's bring in CNN military analyst. My gut feeling, okay, so early on when we were playing live now, I was thinking counterintelligence, head fake, you know, with Iran, make it seem as though there was some sort of lack of communication between the United States and Israel. I'm changing my thought process here. When she's playing this and it's coming from CNN, I am starting to think, that the United States was spying on Israel and Israel caught them and somehow leaked the information. They actually caught, they, they actually caught, this is what my gut feeling is. I think Israel, Israel actually leaked the information out of this five eye package to show to the world that the United States was actually spying on Israel. Because it doesn't make sense for the United States to leak it out and to be and, and and to be caught spying on Israel. Why would they why would the United States leak that out? Or why would some of the five eyes within the apparatus leak that out, knowing that they wanted to find out what Israel was planning on doing? Right? Because they would be tipping their hand and they were saying they would be saying that they've been spying on Israel. Why would they want to do that? You might as well keep that to your vest and be very quiet about it. All right. Most likely, somehow, some way, Israel found out, or at least a very, very close ally to Israel within the Five Eyes apparatus found out and decided leak the package to show that they that the, that Israel knew that they were spying on. So this is what this goes back to what I was saying before. The Ribby said to Netanyahu in the early eighties. Do not worry about the international community. Don't be fearful and don't be boastful and you'll, you'll be victorious on the seven fronts. All right. Now, he said that to Netanyahu in the 80s. Netanyahu wasn't president in the 80s. Or the prime minister of the United States, of, of the prime minister of, of Israel. He was a UN delegate. There's a seven front war. Netanyahu has been elevated multiple times to the, to the prime ministership. 
And, you know, this is the time to knock out Iran. Now, we know the United States doesn't want Israel to knock out Iran. We know that there's leaks. We know that the Biden administration really doesn't, it is not really aligned with Israel. They're not so much aligned with, with the Palestinians either. But they just want to kick the can down the road. And that's exactly what the Ruby said not to do. So I would not be surprised. All right. Live now probably didn't, didn't know about this kind of like how it was being leaked. Right. I find it very interesting with CNN. CNN parrots what the intelligence agencies want them to parrot. All right. So with that in mind, it seems to me that someone within the intelligence agency, and it could have been even the Israelis that found out about this intelligence package that the U.S. built up, that someone sympathetic to these Israelis or the Israelis themselves actually leaked the package out. And that package is trying to show to the world that the United States has been spying on Israel and in, in many ways, maybe, you know, trying to circumvent their operations. Because I wouldn't be surprised that if Israel, I think Israel is, we know, we know that Biden talked to the Iranians, you know, saying, you know, be careful with the strikes with Israel, right? you know, and trying to talk them down. And I, you know, the, the, the United States has been trying to broker it. What areas would be okay to hit? What areas not to be okay to hit, right? I think the Israelis are like saying, you know, you're playing both sides of the fence with, I think the Israelis are thinking that the United States is playing both sides of the fence, right? So they don't feel confident that there's no leaks in the, the Biden administration. They don't feel confident that they don't that they have a partner that will allow them to get the job done because it seems that the united states constantly wants to kick the can down the road and it only gets worse so this is the time to get it out to, to get iran's nuclear capability destroyed and, and remove the theocratic regime this is the time to do it if it's not now when is it going to be so i'm starting to think that maybe it was encounter some sort of counter intelligence, you know, some sort of counter operation to try to do a head fake on Iran. I'm starting to think that we've actually seen what just played out is spying on of the United States on Israel, and someone found out and leaked it out. That's what I'm thinking that, that happened. Now. But maybe I'll change my mind because I had I had a different thought when I was listening to live now. It's an interesting, there's an interesting thing dynamic going on here. I think it's more probable that there, there was the United States was spying on Israel because Israel was not giving enough information to the United States about the strike package. There, you know, probably Israel was being a little coy about it because they were worried that either it that the United States would try to circumvent them, try to prevent them from doing the, the strike package, or they would leak some of that out. The United States was caught spying on Israel. That's what it looks like. But the question is, why would CNN say that if they are part of the intelligence op operation? Hmm. Colonel Cedric Layton. Uh, Colonel, great to have you here. Good to be with you, Jessica. I want to ask you first about this breaking news story we're following tonight, that the U.S. is investigating this leak of highly classified U.S. intelligence about Israel's plans for retaliation against Iran. They began circulating these documents Friday online, being posted on a pro-Iranian Telegram account. In your opinion, how damaging is that leak? Well, it could be quite damaging and it could be an indicator, Jessica, of several different things. One of them might be uh, that the Iranians have somebody who is working for them within U.S. intelligence. 
uh, that would be a very bad thing to put it mildly. Oh, right. uh, the other thing it could be that it's somebody who is trying to, to in essence, take maps into their own hands and uh, trying to prevent Israel from doing things by revealing. That was what my original really thought. Right there. Uh, the documents themselves may not go into great detail about uh, what the Israelis are doing, but of course there may be more uh, documents where those came from, and uh, we could find out more perhaps in the next few days, but it's clearly a damaging uh, situation and documents like that uh, because they have not only uh, high classification level, but they expose sensitive collection method uh, and sensitive collection targets. They should never uh, be released like this uh, at, at all. And, and what kind of effect? And he missed the other two possibilities. Down. Israel caught U.S. spying, and Israel decided to leak the information to sh to, to 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 show that it you know you know shot over the bow to the to the Pentagon that hey we know that you're spying on us. Two, you know the other option is is that it's the head fake with Iran. So I don't think that that there's an infiltration of Iranian intelligence officers inside the Five Eye apparatus. I don't think that's the case. Question is, are there individuals within the Five Eyes that are trying to circumvent Israel from striking Iran? And if so, why? It's a big question, why? You know, if you have the Five Eyes not wanting to knock out Iran and its nuclear capability, then all you really want is to, to, to kick the can down the road and then the rib is right. Ribby and what he told Netanyahu in the 80s was right. Don't listen to the international community because they're just going to hurt you. And then Israel catches, potentially catches the U.S. spying and decides to leak it out, or at least someone sympathetic to the Israeli cause finds out and decides to leak it out and to, to show the, the true hand of the United States. Or this is some sort of counter, some sort of misinformation counterintelligence operation to try to do a head fake with Iran and, and make Iran think that Israel is going to strike one way and that there's some sort of infighting with the U.S. and, 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 the, the, and the Israelis and the strike package is something totally different. It could be. Now, that my gut feeling, my original gut feeling was it was a head fake and that the strike package is actually something totally different. And that to create this, inf make the perception that there's some sort of infighting going on between the U.S. and Israel. That was my original thought. And maybe that probability is now 50%. I, I was thinking it was higher, like 80% or so. But maybe that, that probability is 50%. And then the other, the other 50% is, is that there was this, someone caught the United States spying on Israel and decided to leak it out to stop, to try to stop that from happening. Um, you know, I'm, it's, I'm not really sure, you know, because it's 50, 50 now, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure, but I wouldn't be surprised that the Biden administration and the intelligence apparatus is trying to get more information out of the Israelis on what the actual strike point is because the Israelis don't trust the Biden administration. Should they, should they really tr trust the Biden administration? Because they, you know, they have to make this, if they're going to do it, they have to do it and they have to win. They have to make it happen. So, and they're probably going to need help by the U.S. So there has to be some sort of, some sort of coordination. So they're, they're fighting two different problems. They're fight, they have to have coordination with the United States, but they have the United States that's trying to prevent them from actually doing it. And you have leaks that are out of the Biden administration. So there's, there's some conflict. I'm not really sure what really happened. Here. Is it some sort of, head fake or is it the United States was caught spying on Israel and someone decided to leak that information out now if the Israelis found out that they were spying on them maybe they would have just talked behind the scenes and said stop it maybe they wouldn't have had someone leak something else so that gives it more credence that it's a it's a head fake I'm not really sure it's strange on um, the military and its preparations, both the Israeli military, but also the U.S., remember, we all remember, has military assets in that region as well. Yeah, absolutely. 40,000 U.S. troops in and around the Middle East right now, and that includes from all the services. Uh, so it could have a significant impact.
fact, uh, certainly uh, the Israelis uh, could be forced to change uh, their plans, could be forced to change the timing of uh, their operations, uh, could be forced to change the targeting, you know, what particular targets they're going after. All these things are possible. Um, it's not a, you know, a foregone conclusion that they will do those kinds of things, but it is definitely possible. And as far as U.S. assets in the region are concerned, uh, they could uh, become targets. Uh, because of the fact that uh, they are uh, not only in the region, but also that they may be seen as aiding the Israeli effort. Whether or not they do that is, of course, a completely different issue. Uh, but the perception might be that they are, in fact, aiding, aiding uh, the Israeli effort. So that would be a, a problem for the U.S. potentially in, in that regard. And, and also today in Israel, uh, there was a drone attack on Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's home. He, no one was home. No one was injured. Um, Iran has denied it was involved, saying it was carried out by Hezbollah. Netanyahu said that agents of Iran were behind that attack. They would pay a heavy price. Hezbollah is not claiming responsibility. Now, let's remember that Hezbollah is uh, sponsored by Iran. So what do you make of all of this? Well, it seems as if you've been getting scam texts like these. It was me. I said that probably means your data has been leaked. And I have all of it. Who leaked it? I did it. I leaked Well, it seems as if uh, either Salah or Iran or both uh, were trying to send a message to the Israelis that their leadership is also potentially vulnerable to attacks. I, and, uh, you know, it would be a logical choice of targets, given the fact that uh, the below leader uh, was killed uh, by the Israelis, and, of course, the Hamas leader was killed by the Israelis, and uh, actually several Hamas leaders uh, in rapid succession. So, uh, in essence, what you had uh, the Israelis uh, do was uh, conduct a, uh, basically, a, a series of decapitation strikes against uh, both uh, Hezbollah and Hamas, and to some extent, Iran uh, as well. And that, of course, then uh, leads the other side, in this case, the Iranians and their proxies, uh, to potentially go after uh, leaders like Netanyahu on the Israeli side. So, in essence, they've upped the ante. And, of course, uh, you know, it's pretty clear that Netanyahu wants to respond once again in kind to this. So we might be on a ladder of escalation as, as this goes forward. I also want to talk about Russia's war in Ukraine because we have some, some really incredible new information, which is that South Korea's spy agency says that North Korea has sent at least 1,500 troops to aid Russia in its war in Ukraine. We have even video of North Korean soldiers receiving Russian uniforms and equipment at a Russian training base. It just reminds us, Colonel, how connected um, a lot of these countries are that are adversaries of the U.S. and its allies. How alarming is this? How should the U.S. and its allies respond? Well, this is alarming. It's not the first time something like this has happened. In fact, during the Korean War back in the early 1950s, uh, the Russians would actually be the pilots of North Korean uh, planes, North Korean fighter jets. And that uh, is something, so I guess so you could say that the North Koreans are paying the Russians back finally for those services. Uh, but uh, the key thing is this, now we have another power potentially getting involved in the war in Ukraine. It shows that Russia uh, has a manpower problem. Uh, they also uh, face significant domestic resistance to actually being drafted into the war in Ukraine. Uh, so the way to solve that manpower shortage appears to be to hire foreign troops. In this case, those foreign troops are North Korean. And that, of course, means that North Korea is more directly involved than we previously thought. And that potentially widens the conflict beyond just Ukraine, Russia. Uh, it could also impact the Korean Peninsula. And, of course, you know, the U.S. has vested interests both in Europe and on the Korean Peninsula. All right, Colonel Cedric Layton, thanks so much. Good to see you. Good to see you too, Jessica. Right. Thank you. So that is the two videos that I wanted to cover for this particular video. Please subscribe to all my channels. I have four channels on YouTube. I have Bright Town, Bit Shoot, and Rumble. Please click the link in the description for those channels and subscribe. Please share the links that I, you know, the, the content I create. Also, please ask your social network to follow me. I need to accrete followers. You know, there's censorship. Follow me on X. I have two feeds on X. You can also follow me on Getter and you can follow me on, on TikTok now. I have a TikTok channel. So please click the links in the description and follow me.
Thank you for listening. Please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com and get the health supplements and, and follow my protocols to slow down the aging process and to boost up your immune system. Thank you for listening and have a nice day.